This is Sam Long. I'm Ron Peters. And I'm John Newton. Welcome to the After Class Podcast. Because the best conversations happen after class. Thanks for joining us. Another episode of the After Class Podcast. We're glad to have you along. This is our uh, first podcast of our new semester. And so we, uh, starting today, are starting a new semester of all the new classes and probably new students and <laughs> all sorts of new things. So we're yeah. excited about that. The coming back from the break is always nice. It's been a good break. <clears throat> I definitely stayed away from the office for a while. It's you, you just need that time where you're just like getting everything out of your head just for a little while so you can reset, start the new semester, start the new year with better headspace. So it was good. Yeah. Speaking of better headspace, you got any uh, big plans for the new year? What you're going to do, accomplish, et cetera? I, yeah, I don't have new plans. Uh, I'm not tackling any kind of a new project or, or whatever, but I'm just trying to take everything that I'm doing to the next level. You know, out at the farm, I'm trying to produce more, produce better, have a, a better strategy for everything I'm doing. So, yeah, nothing new, but trying to do better than I did last year. My goal is to read all the way through Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics, which is 13 volumes of dense theological writing that moves between English and German and Latin regularly. <laughs> but uh. mostly it's an English translation, but there's a ton of other stuff in it. And, you know, one of these volumes alone is like 850 pages. So the whole thing is almost 10,000 pages. Wow. So I, I've kind of mapped it out. It's going, if I read every day, 23 pages, then I can get through it in a year. <laughs> oh my so gosh. I, I've long wanted to do this. And it may sound just like an eggheady thing where it's like, wow, you're just reading this giant mammoth theological tome. <laughs> but my motivation is actually not all that academic. Like Karl Barth is someone who loves the church and loves the word of God and has a very Christ-centered worldview in his theology, in his ecclesiology, everything. And so I'm really reading it for the formation that I know mm. will happen from it. So he's, I'm going to leave this year being a better thinker who's going to love the church more and think more critically about the the influences from the world that creep into our thought and our theology. Yeah. He just has a great way of exposing the things that we don't assume are at play in how we think about Scripture, how we think about faith, how we think about Christ. And so, so I'm for me, it's it's tough, dense reading. <laughs> it's slow going. Yeah. I read it slower than if I were to just read out loud because wow. I'm slowing down. I, I have my phone there with translating from Latin to English, mm -hmm. like for the phrases I don't recognize. Mm -hmm. And uh, But uh, it it's quasi-devotional. Like I look forward to reading it because every time it's like, wow, that, that's kind of faith-enriching stuff. And so, yeah, it's, it's a goal I've wanted to do now for over a decade since my PhD program when I first started reading BART. Uh, but now I want to just read all of it. So Sweet. that's my goal. Yeah, yeah, 23 pages of BART is not like 23 pages of pretty much anything else. Right. So yeah. so that, it sounds like, oh, 23 pages, you can knock that out. Like, well, yeah. maybe, maybe it, not. It'll be, yeah, on a good day, that'll take me 45 minutes. Yeah. On a tough day where I got to look up a lot of stuff, it'll take me around an hour. So I'm I'm dedicating about an hour a day. Yep. For the entire year, I did give myself a head start because I assume there will be days when <laughs> right. I can't do it when I have a splitting headache or I'm on right. medicine or I'm traveling. So I'm trying to build up. So I'm like 140 pages in already, trying to give myself <laughs> a little head start so I can kind of stay on track. But well, I'm looking forward to hearing what you get out of it. I think there'll yeah. be some great conversations in the in 2024 that emerge out of that reading. So yeah. I think we're all going to get the uh, the spillover from your reading there. Yeah. And Tommy Mullen, our special librarian collection guy at Great Lakes, uh, and also a Great Lakes grad, uh, he's going to be reading it with me. So uh, there is some accountability there. We have a kind of an online chart where he can track my progress and see that I'm on pace and say, <laughs> hey, what's going on here? You're kind of slipping. Mm -hmm. So we And I hope we can have, him and I can have conversations about what we're reading too. So anyone else who's interested in that, let me know. You can, you might be a, a week or two late into it, but uh, it's something you might you might enjoy as well. But. All right, you say. Uh, okay, I have nothing so <laughs> deep. Um, I'm actually uh, having divested myself of uh, many responsibilities in the last year or so. I'm going to try to get back into scholarship, you know, uh, and do some more writing. Uh, I got some presentations lined up for this year already, and 
Uh, I mean, creating for me, I, I mean, I get energy from creating things, new yes. things, and so uh, writing that. But like, I'm writing a new class for this new semester, so like, it's uh, it's a lot of work, but it's also energy giving to me. Uh, and so, I have a couple little projects like that I like to create, and uh, so we'll see how it turns out. Yeah, awesome. yeah, I've got one writing project that I want to get going on, but. I'm not going to announce it right now. I'll wait for a while, and once I feel like it's solid, then I'll let everybody know what it is. So. Well, I'll announce mine. So if you have any resources, I'm open to <laughs> um, I'm just kind of talking, uh, looking at uh, the, the action and the language of lament in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and lament. And just kind of you know, looking at um, mental health issues in modern day. And I'm working with another student, a psychology counseling student, who's bringing in that side, which I'm not a— by any means, an expert uh, in, uh, and just see what the connections are, and see uh, how perhaps the Bible could be helpful and informative, or uh, or see where the Bible was maybe ahead of its time in dealing with these sorts of things. Um, again, not trying to uh, anachronize the Bible or you know psychoanalyze dead people, but just right. look at you know, this is what, how they responded when a terrible thing happened. Yeah. So what might we learn from that? I imagine there'll be some podcasts that spin off of it. No, that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe an SCJ paper. That's the plan. Um, yep. Yeah. So, how about an SBL paper? Uh, we'll see. We'll see how the AAR paper goes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the same paper, both of them, I think. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Cool. Great. I look forward to it. All right. So uh, we want to do something new, a new series. A, a new type of series, too. Yeah. Something. We've talked a long time about going through a book together. Yeah. And uh, a Bible book. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, Way to be clear. you know, we yeah, haven't talked about sex in a long time on the podcast. It has been a while, yes. And, you know, one of two of our most popular series got into issues of sex and sexuality sure. and gender and uh, women and the church and things of that nature. Um, but what, you know, what the Bible says most about this topic is in the book Song of Songs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, and it's not a very long book. Was it eight chapters? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a book that is rich, that has a rich history of interpretation. Yeah. Uh, one that people are often very curious about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when they try to read it on their own, they have a hard time processing what is going on. They have a sense of what's there, right. but how does it all hang together? What is it? Um, how does it apply to the church? How? Uh, yeah. yeah, and us being very indebted to kind of a Victorian uh, era understanding of life, talking about sex and things makes some people uncomfortable. Yep. On their hand, some people are like all about it and don't have any filter. And so yeah, so you know, in the church where it, we often err on the side of, you know, <laughs> don't talk about it at least yep. in this way. Yep. Uh, we have this whole book that uh, d delves into these sorts of topics. Do we have to issue some kind of a warning in advance? You know, be careful who's listening to the podcast going forward. You know, I, don't want. I mean, don't want tender ears out there. I think we're going to be tactful in how we talk about it. Good. Yeah, but we read the text. The text does say what the text says. But yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah. It's, we can be tactful, but you know, it's it is what it is. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beware, we're going to be talking about things that the Bible talks about. <laughs> oh, can't believe we would do that. The nerve. Yeah. <laughs> if if you feel like you need a warning, you've been forewarned. Um, but so yeah, that's what we're going to do, and uh, it's going to be a series. We're going to today. Uh, we're going to at least do one episode of background issues, locating the topic. Mm -hmm. Um, getting some kind of big picture categories to work with, answering some big picture introductory questions. And then we're going to work our way through the text Yeah, and uh, in, in coming weeks. So it's going to be a series. We don't know how long it's going to be. It might go quicker than we anticipate or... And it might be the first of many <laughs> series like Lower. this or maybe right. awful and we never do this again. <laughs> I think it'll be pretty good though. Yeah, we look forward to your feedback on this model of the podcast series. Just yeah. kind of working through a single book um, and if you like it, then we'll explore other books like this. Yeah. So yeah, we picked a a fun one to do, right. uh, but it's also shortish. So that at some point we're like, yeah, we got to stop this. The first suggestion was Ezekiel, and that was I pushed back against that for many reasons, not the least of which it's forever long. Forty eight uh, chapters. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, brutal. I'm a huge fan of Ezekiel. Sure, it's a great book. And we may still go after, it, but there's no way we're gonna read it through the no, whole thing. No, but like. Yeah, pick snippets along the way. Hitting the highlights is yeah. still going to be a long series. Yeah, absolutely. But saying there's highlights, is that suggesting there's lowlights that we can skip over? Yeah. All right. <laughs> no. There, are, <laughs> there are enough representative points yes. that that would equip someone to right. read the whole book on their own and maybe be able to The prophets more like the repetition, in which approach. we don't have to, you know. The same thing is going to be actually a song of songs. Like, oh, this chapter, we've seen this sort of thing before. But anyway, don't not to yeah. preview too much. Right. Yeah. 
So we're going to start with the first verse, <laughs> and uh, As one that does. might that might take us the entire episode it because <laughs> it really opens up the interpretive questions and issues. So we'll be working from the uh, NRSV UE, the NRSV Updated Edition. Yep. I still uh, got the plain out, Jane, but that's fine. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure there's going to be any difference. I don't know if there is. We'll this is we've we've done some serious Bible Gateway research. And, and there's <laughs> there's only so many ways this is translated Correct. in modern translations. Um, but, Ron, you want to read it for us? Since I'm the New Testament guy and have very little say to say about it, this is my one opportunity to be able to contribute. throwing you a bone. Way to get I appreciate involved, John. that. Be involved, Ron. Yeah. That's, that's great. <laughs> so, chapter 1, verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Mm, amen. There's my big contribution. <laughs> <laughs> and and what what did you say the NIV said? Uh, it says Solomon's Song of Songs. Yeah, <laughs> basically the same thing. Basically, yeah. They just had to say it differently, and there was only so many ways to do it. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. So when you hear that, I mean, when you hear that phrase, Solomon's Song of Songs, or the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. I mean, what do you, you know when you hear it as not as a Bible scholar who's researched this, but just like a an English speaking person, what what immediately comes to mind that you think this phrase means? I mean, it gives me a sense of possession. Like somehow Solomon is directly responsible for producing this epic poem. And so yeah, I think that's why, you know, people often call it the Song of Solomon. Right. Because that suggests uh authorship or in some way direct uh influence on it, you know, its production or whatever. Yeah, I mean it's like Aesop's fables or something like that, where this yeah. person created this thing in some way, as you yep. say, which is tipping a little hat. But no, I mean, that, right. that's so, like, yeah, he has, he's related to this, uh, this document. Most people, I think, assume that he wrote it, yep. right? I think that's when you read it, when it says Solomon's Song of Songs, you, the assumption, I think, for most, ever, the average person is, oh, he wrote this thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and if he didn't write it, he was responsible for bringing it all together into its final form. Right. So, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, we're all taking turns. <laughs> <laughs> And and since it's kind of it's not like the history books of the Old Testament or like the law material or the or oracles or prophets prophetic narratives even it it kind of falls more into the category of wisdom literature yeah and Solomon is you know the figure in the Bible who is most associated with wisdom sure right and, and so that I think also plays into the the notion that this must be something that was written by Solomon right yeah or at least he was directly responsible for it mm -hmm. in some way or another. Um, but Sam, can you kind of tell us a little bit about the Hebrew here and what options that presents us? Sure. Um, so what we have here, this is a, a preposition, and uh, we call it the pre prepositional lamed. It's one letter that when it's put in front of a word, it uh, it means a couple different things. And so uh, we have, you all know, prepositions in the English language, to, for, above, with, about, to name a few. Around. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so when you see this All the one, things that you can do in a box, right? Like yes. on the box, right. by the box, in yeah. the box, <laughs> through the box. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they, they show spatial and sometimes temporal relationships. Right. And so they're they're relationship words. Yeah. And so this one, there, there are three of these one-letter prepositions in the Hebrew language. This one, the L or Lamed. And it means actually quite a few different things. It's, it, it doesn't always mean the same thing. Um, a lot of times it can mean a possession type thing like you're talking about. Uh, something that belongs to this person. Um, it also so can Ron's be, office. Yes, Ron's office. Now, yep. did did Ron make the office? No, no, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I but, wasn't the original occupant of this office that yeah, we're in. So. Right, um, but at the moment, it belongs to you. Um, at times, it can mean something that uh, is for someone. Uh, so I, I bought a, a a Christmas present for you all. It's my presents. The present is my present. So it's, you're yeah. welcome. So, like, <laughs> if you gave it to Ron, it's Ron's present. Yeah, but it's from it's from Sam. Me. From right? Sam. Yep. Um, it, it can mean uh, again four, two, and four kind of have a similar sort of idea. It's something that's like in respect to someone. Um, but it it can mean also of someone that they literally created this thing. So, um, I guess I could say like my child, Sam's Sam's son, right? Uh, where like I created that kid. Now he doesn't sell you belong to me in the sense of like I own him but yeah. um, I helped create him and so this like there's this uh, various functions uh, that exist actually I went to a paper a long time ago with my doctoral work where a guy did a whole thing about the presidential lamed and he went through different uses usages and then he ended with one that's not often used but occasionally against 
and he used it oh, to yeah. talk about Psalm 51 especially, which it says of David, but actually he suggests that it's a psalm against David. <laughs> it was quite <laughs> oh, a good wow. paper and quite an interesting uh, idea. But that one, you know, also it's on the list, but not so much. And so the same idea can be used for actually a lot of the psalms talking about David, yep. uh, where people assume, oh, David wrote all these. Well, just because it says a psalm of David doesn't mean he wrote it. Um, yeah. and for lots of reasons we could cite, uh, there are things where, no, he probably didn't write this one, but it's about him. Uh, it could be written for him as king, like somebody came along and said, oh, man, you're an awesome king, David, this is for you, right? The, so uh, in the same way, the, 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 uh, the Song of Songs, it's Solomon's. <laughs> and the question is, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, it's in relation to Solomon. Yes. And the nature of that relationship is not clear. It could be about Solomon. Sure. You know, and in that sense, it's, you know, it's a song of Solomon. Yeah. Uh, of his life or, or of something pertaining to him, it, you know, possession. And the same thing goes with Proverbs, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yep. there are Proverbs are sometimes grouped, and these are the Proverbs of so-and-so, which just might mean it's just in their collection. Yeah. Because right? when it comes to wisdom literature, you are looking far and wide for wisdom from all over the place because you have the conviction that if it's about the same world, it's going to speak the same kind of truths. Well, and the perfect example is in chapter 25 of Proverbs, talks about the Proverbs of Hezekiah. There's no indication that Hezekiah ever wrote a proverb right. that we have. Maybe he did, but it's more likely that as king, he's paying someone to bring these together, and it's like dedicated to a collection dedicated to Hezekiah. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like uh, every king has a good collection of Proverbs. Of course. And when you have other kings that kind of want to come visit and they want to see your wisdom, you got to have some material to show them. <laughs> That's and, right. Uh, you might be a writer who's generated your own, or you might be, like most kings are, someone who has a royal court that carries out functions mm-hmm. for you mm-hmm. and collects for you. And so you have a collection that is your your reign's functional collection, yep. Yep, which have, might have multiple authors. So so the, so the we talk about what does this verse mean, right? And, you know, what does the Bible say? What does Solomon's, this what does this book say about itself? Mm-hmm. <laughs> It says something that's kind of ambiguous. Yes, that it has it has a connection to Solomon. Mm-hmm. If you want to know what does God's word say about this book, it's connected to Solomon, right? In some way. Anything we say beyond that is going to be our theory mm-hmm. of what that connection is, mm-hmm. right? And we want that theory to be based on um, content within the book itself, right? Like if we had an external attestation, like you know, a book written around the same time period, right, uh, that talked about maybe the authorship of the Song of Songs, right, like in 300 B.C. or 200 B.C. or, you know, 100, like anything that might be a clue of who wrote it, especially near, you know, that would be really helpful. <laughs> sure. But we don't have that no. about yeah. this book. We don't have early commentaries on it. We'll talk later about the earliest commentary we do have on it. But it's not going to be until the first century. Um, and so there's a huge multi... <laughs> multi hundreds of years gap, yep. right? Yeah. Um, and so what we're going to try to do, at least, is look at internal evidence from within the book itself for clues about what it might mean for this to be connected to Solomon. Mm-hmm. So I've just got a list here um, that I'll talk about, um, and maybe I want to read some of these. Uh, I'll let you guys decide. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll talk about them, and well, let, let's read them. I think that would be helpful. Uh, so the first one is uh, chapter 1, verse 4 be a verse that has a reference that could be to uh, Solomon. So, Sam, you want to read this? Sure. Yeah. Draw me after you. Let us make haste. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will restore, extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. Mm. That's the idea of the king has brought me into his chambers. Yep. And so, again, association with Solomon, and so maybe it's the, the woman talking about marrying Solomon, right? Or coming in and being a potential wife for this guy, this King Solomon. Uh, just the use of the word king in light of it being called uh, belonging to Solomon. Like, well, who else would you think of? When it's written from the first person, it was written in the first person, you know, draw me after you, the king's brought me into his chambers. So it's written from the first person from the point of view of the, the bride, but still referring to the king. Yeah. But I mean, is it literally the king or is it just like some, hey, you're like a king to me. Hey, know? champ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. So the, the potential connection is king language. Yeah. But there are multiple kings out there. Right, yeah. Right. And and there are, people can refer to kings uh, 
use that language to refer to someone who's not a king, mm -hmm. but metaphorically, especially in poetry, yeah, right. Uh, you, you know, you're the goat, right? Greatest of all time. <laughs> you're saying something about someone, but you're not necessarily being literal about it, right? Right. right. It's interesting. She's not called queen in the whole book. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. I mean, you can do what you want with that, but that's you know, it's interesting that this uh, figure is used, but the opposite is not. Yeah. Interesting. And just right off the bat, I mean, these are the first. This is part of the very first verses that mm -hmm. kind of launched the book. The majority of the book is in the voice of a woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is interesting about its connection to Solomon, right? Like, if he were reflecting, right, and he was the primary voice of the book, uh, you would assume that the primary perspective would be that of the king. Right. Um, but we're going to see, not only does this verse reflect, it's the perspective of someone talking about a king, or, you know, referring to someone in royal language, but it's not the king talking. Uh, so another verse, um, and we see uh, this is 1-7, and again in 6-2, um, and I mean, this is maybe not royal language, but it's the opposite of royal language, and in that sense it's relevant. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ron, do you want to read... Uh, one seven. One seven. Yeah. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who is veiled beside the flocks of your companions? Okay. And before we talk about that, let's do six two as well. Okay. Um, I'll do that one. Okay. My beloved has gone down to his garden to the bed of spices to pasture his flock in the gardens and to gather lilies. <laughs> um, yeah, you get a sense of the kind of language in this book. Um, but both of these passages refer to the beloved of the woman using shepherd-like language, mm -hmm. describing yeah. this one in shepherd terms. Which, again, this shepherd can be metaphorical, right? Yeah. Um, or it can also be literal. You know, right. So take me to the place where you shepherd your flocks. Um, the connection with Solomon here is that Solomon we don't see as a shepherd. Right. Someone who, not, like David, he was a guy who literally did shepherding mm -hmm. before he became king. We don't have that same association with Solomon, right? And at the same time, though, they are a they are a uh, a people, an agrarian society where that's part of who they are, right? So yep. while Solomon may not have been a shepherd, someone could have said, "Man, I could bet you were a great. Sh I bet you could be a great shepherd, Solomon, because you're great at everything, right? Being complimentary, <laughs> yep. right? At the same, anyway, just, it's just a thought, like." Yes, of course he he did probably didn't ever shepherd anything, but that's part of who they are. And so, in the same way, we could call it you know we could say people are good at things when they don't actually do them. Yeah, and I can see that as you said, they're an agrar agrarian society. Boy, I can speak to that. It's a tough word. It is. Uh, I can see where that language would dominate just because it's part of their economics, it's part of their culture. Um, so yeah, that would just be a staple of their poetry. It's hard to say. Yeah, and. If you read books like Ezekiel, mm -hmm. shepherd language is used of kings. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so it can be a metaphor for a king. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and it's like shepherd your people. But it's often when it's used in that way, it's you're shepherding, peop shepherding yes. people. Right. right? And, and in these verses, it's actually take me where you shepherd your flocks. Yeah. With yep. the assumption that that's where there's dirt and open air. Right. Not, you know, where you, you know, set up your throne and make decisions about the fate of the people. <laughs> right. Uh, the the places she's talking about, once we get into these chapters, are going to be open air spaces where yep. animals are. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But but it, so anyway, it's interesting. So shepherd language is not quite Solomonic, although in metaphorically speaking, it can be. So just like king language can be metaphorical or literal, mm -hmm. shepherd language can be metaphorical or literal. Mm -hmm. So there's some wiggle room here, and we, yep. and we just we just need more evidence. All right, uh, chapter one, verse twelve. Yep. I think that's Flip to you, right. Sam. While the king was on his couch. My nard gave forth its fragrance. <laughs> I love the word nard. I don't know why. <laughs> um, uh, yes, so, so the idea is she's interacting with the king who's on his couch, and who else would be doing that except the queen? Again, going back to what we said. But or it could concubine. Also be, or, right. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yep. But yeah, so there again, it's a king reference. Mm -hmm. So she's referred to her lover as king a couple of times yep. and as shepherd a couple of times. Yeah, and here even, like, even, I mean, this is, you know, nard and, like, nice-smelling things, which she goes on to talk about and, and so forth. You're Even if she was saying, hey, you're my king, though he's not a king, 
the the things she's talking about are expensive royalty type things. Mm. Like yep. not your average shepherd or average, you know, whatever blacksmith's not going to walk around with a bag of nard and myrrh. <laughs> it's just not. Yeah. yeah. And that's just metaphorical. Like, of course. My perfume. I smelled yes. good. Yes. <laughs> when approaching your bed. <laughs> yeah. Especially back then, that's an important point. You know, when you don't have showers and soap readily available all the time. So all right. another passage, which maybe is longer than most passages, um, is chapter three, verses six through eleven. Uh, you get it. Probably the longest huh, section yeah. that uses royal language. Oh, yep. <clears throat> I know, right? Who is that coming up from the wilderness like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Look, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty men of the mighty men of Israel, all equipped with swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh because, (laughs) because of alarms at night. Sorry about that. King Solomon made himself a palanquin from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior was inlaid with stone. Daughters of Jerusalem, come out and look at King Solomon, at the crown with which his mother crowned him, on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. So there we've got like the probably the biggest sort of, uh, nod to Solomon. Look, he's coming. We see him coming. Everybody come out and look at the king. But it's kind of interesting because it's almost like he's a bit player. You know, everybody's looking at him, but is he one of the main characters? Or is everybody just happy that the king is walking by and this is a, a celebratory moment? Well, it seems to be a wedding procession based on verse 11, <laughs> right? So the celebration is him getting married. And so the implication is to who? <laughs> yeah, the language here, you know, and it's going to switch right after this chapter four is going to start, and it's going to be the voice of the male beloved. Right. And and so we don't have any more data to work with here to kind of help us know more about this. That's where it ends. But yeah, in this, you know, poem, the woman is talking to her neighbors saying, look, look at Solomon and all this royal fanfare on his weather, wedding day wearing, you know, the crown that his mom made for him. But she doesn't say our wedding day right or look he's coming to get me or like so this is the verse that the first verse in the book we're at the end of chapter three it's only eight chapters where solomon is mentioned by name Mm -hmm. right he's in the preface but like once the content starts this is the first time he's named in the actual content of the book and he's he's a player in the background yeah that that the woman is talking to her friends about and there's nothing in her conversation with her friends that suggests that she is somehow connected with him, mm-hmm. other than she's one who sees him. Yep. I, I don't know. Maybe it's, is it the idea of like idolizing? Like, look, like I hope my wedding's like that, where my my guy comes riding in like this with all this uh, splendor. I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. Is, is that what she's thinking about? Or just, it's an observation like, oh, look, there's Solomon. He's getting married. Cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. But she's apparently marrying someone else in this yes, home. Not, seemingly. Not the one who's singing. Right. Yeah. Unless this is, you know, the daughters of Jerusalem singing, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah. All right. We'll move on with this. We'll go into deeper when we get to these yeah. chapters, yeah. but um, yeah, we're just kind of getting little snippets. Uh, so now uh, chapter five, verse seven, I guess it's my turn. Um, Making their rounds in the city, the sentinels found me. And this is the woman speaking. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, uh, it seems to be a dream sequence. She's describing a dream things she's experiencing in the dream because it started out in verse two i was sleeping but my heart was awake and then she goes in to talk about this so uh making their rounds in the city the sentinels so like the the watchmen Mm -hmm. uh, guarding the city they beat me they wounded me they took away my mantle those sentinels of the walls i charge you O daughters of jerusalem if you find my beloved tell him this i am faint with love um so i so it seems to be this is a dream sequence. Uh, maybe she f- awakened and this was actually happening. I don't know, but that's at least one of the interpretations. But the woman is such that the city guards would find her and beat her. Yeah. And then she tells her husband, look for me or her beloved. Look what I'm struggling for in my search for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if she was the queen, 
or betrothed to the queen, <laughs> or even a concubine. <laughs> yeah. The guards don't beat you. No, not happening. No, you that's... beat Solomon, that's the last beating you give. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's so the woman seems to be, at least here, of a lower enough stature where she could even fear that she's vulnerable to like city guards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, causing her physical harm. Yeah. Yep. It just seems yeah, it seems out of place for a queen or a wife or someone who belongs to Solomon. Somebody who's a part of the royal court is right. not going to endure something like right. this. Yeah. And when she talks about her beloved, it's just tell him I'm struggling and I, I faint for him in this struggle. Mm-hmm. It's not tell him what's going on and yeah. <laughs> bring justice upon these right. minions of oh, you. Oh, when <laughs> Solomon hears, you're going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not, yeah, it's not like that. So it's interesting that the beloved is brought in, but not as someone who has a chance of protecting her. Right. Uh, he doesn't have that kind of status. Like he's just as vulnerable to the city guards as she is. Um, not the one in charge of them. But. All right. Next verse, um, chapter six, verses thirteen. This is kind of an interesting one. Return, return, O oh Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. Why should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? And so here, the the woman is called a Shulamite. Yeah, she's not the one speaking right at this point. So who's who's speaking? Uh, probably the the chorus, the women, the daughters of Jerusalem. Just like we, we can talk about what that her is. her female posse, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> her what are the what do they call it these days? There's a bridesmaid. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's anyway. I'm I'm showing my age and stupidity for not knowing the slang of the day. Uh, anyway. A posse but, of girls. Uh, there's, girl there's, posse. There's, like there's that. a, that's not the term. It's something else. Anyway. I fine. have no idea what I know. it is because I'm older than the audience is yelling, you idiot. It's fine. Gaggle? Um, gaggle. Yep. <laughs> the gaggle of girls is what it is. <laughs> oh, <my gosh. laughs> oh, Never Lord. listen to this podcast again. <laughs> so anyway, so they're saying, hey, come back. Come back. We want to see you. Right? And But they call her Shulamite. And so the question is, what's Shulamite? Um, don't know is the answer. <laughs> But there are some conjectures about what this is. Um, like, it's not like there's a, a, a people group called the Shulamites that we know of, right? Is the, there a the, Shulam? Is there some place we recognize as Shulam? Well, I mean, in Hebrew, this word sounds a lot like Solomon. Shulomo, right? Right, it, like a Solomonite. Yes, almost. <clears throat> it, it's not quite there, but at least sounds like that. Yes, okay. and there is there is a place. Uh, well, a group of people, the Shunammites. Right, which is a different word. And this sounds like Shunammite, but it's different. But Shulamite is interesting because, you know, David's uh, bed warmer. Yeah, Abishag. Uh, Abishag, like when he's old and kind of cold at night in his age, they, they get someone to be his, to sleep with him, to lay in his bed, to literally provide heat. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's a Shunammite. Right. Uh, and and the, so the word almost is like a combination of, Shunammite and Solomon. <laughs> so it's a weird word. Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, I mean, it's hard, not much to say about it. I mean, uh, Solomon or right Shalom, right? The idea of completeness and wholeness, and some say you know peace. I mean, yes. So are they? Is it a term of affection? Like, hey, complete one, perfect one. We want to see you again, as opposed to like an ethnicity or something. I, like I don't know. Yeah. And is is it a play on words? With Solomon's name, right, and and with David's woman, like he had a wife figure, who was a Shunammite. And yeah, is, a, is there a blanket? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so is that, you know, is that play on words and you know going on here? Right. It's that's one of the theories because we don't have a place necessarily where we have Shulamites from. Right. So something poetic might be going on that's playing off of... So it's it's in the conversation about possibly related to Solomon verses without really having his name. Yep. Yep. So it's more about the woman and, yeah, hard to do more. All right, uh, next one is 7-5. Your head crowns you like Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in his tresses, or in the tresses, I should say. So a king is trapped in your hair is what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get out of your hair. Absalom? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's something along that lines. I guess I guess that could apply to me in some way with yeah, uh, sure. you know, the long tresses. There. In some way. <laughs> <laughs> some really weird way that we probably don't want to get into. But the woman is speaking here, and she's talking about her male lover, and, and she's using royal language again. Yeah. Right? 
Uh, I think she's maybe referring to him in in a kind of royal way. Mm -hmm. Solomon's not named, but this royal language again, kind of balancing out the shepherding language, sure, which you've seen in other places. So, uh, and now the last one. Um, chapter 8, verses 11 through 12. Very significant because the book ends in verse 14. And so this is kind of, I don't know, near the conclusion of the book. And so, um, yeah, so it's perhaps the last one. Oh, it's my turn again? Sure. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He entrusted the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring, uh, was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is for myself. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. Hmm. Interesting verses. Yeah. So, like, separate from Solomon, creating distance from mm -hmm. Solomon, not hearing that, reading that correctly? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. For sure. So, it's like, Solomon has this really nice, expensive, fruitful vineyard, and you're worth more than that. Is basically what it's saying. And so the question is, is it reminding Solomon that your wife's worth more than your vineyard, buddy? Or is it just saying this other thing where, like, no, like, Solomon has this thing, but you're uh, the woman, like, or is it the man? I always get confused. Mm -hmm. Like, you're more valuable than that. Yeah. It's not associating necessarily with Solomon. It's using that, perhaps, as an illustration. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's definitely the woman talking, mm -hmm. and she's talking about his great vineyard, you know, that brings forth thousands, right? Right. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of the other, the only other verse that mentions Solomon in the storyline, which is he has this wonderful wedding procession with all these people and right and this glorious palanquin right, and now he has this glorious vineyard. Mm -hmm. But the verse is definitely a, a contrast. Solomon has this glorious thing. My vineyard, by way of contrast, the phrase by way of contrast right. is not there, but it kind of this is the way it reads. <laughs> My very own is for myself. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand and the keepers of the fruit two hundred. Mm -hmm. And so there's something like you can have your thing, Solomon. I'm having this thing that's my own. Right. Yeah. And and because this is not about vineyards, <laughs> right? This is this is a love poem. This is about love, right? And it's almost like Solomon has this glorious vineyards. Like and if you look at his, um concubines his you know massive entourage of women both wives and concubines there's hundreds yeah but she has her own mm -hmm. her beloved her her one vineyard which is all she needs yeah. which is presumably the lover that she chooses yeah which is not solomon well that's what i was thinking it's like I don't want to just be a number for you solomon i don't want to be one of your 700 or your 300 I have this one lover who is mine and I am his. And so there's something very beautiful about that exclusive relationship that sorry Solomon, you don't get, you know, you don't get to have this. You know, it's better. So yeah, it's instead of saying Solomon is the focus of this, Solomon is in many ways the uh um well, what's the term I'm looking for? He is the he, I'm not getting the words right, but he's the opposite of what you're doing here. He's not the focus of this person's love. He is the one that we're comparing ourselves against and saying we have something better. So I'm yeah. losing my words. Same. Uh, and religion. <laughs> <laughs> As R.E.M. said. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and that those are all the verses, right, that mm -hmm. have king language or Solomon language or something that seems not king-like, like the yeah. shepherd language, right? right. Um or like she's being treated with someone who does not have a relationship with the king mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so in the book, Solomon is never the voice speaking. Mm -hmm. um, he is a figure who's named twice, and he's named twice as an, someone who has distance from the woman Yeah. Uh, and is never really spoken about as having intimate relations with the woman. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So in light of that kind of evidence, and of course we're going to read through it solely to kind of flesh out more, mm -hmm. but when you read it solely, it's not giving you information that's radically different right. than what we picked up from the... It's pretty representative of, of the flow and the feel of the book. Um, so in light of internal evidence, uh, what do you guys think about um, what it means that this is the Song of Songs, which is 
to Solomon or about Solomon or Solomon's. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't think it's authorship. I don't think he wrote it um, because, again, if he did, it's definitely from a female's perspective a lot. Um, I don't think it was necessarily written about him other than him being used as the sort of, I don't know, the opposite or just like a reference. Was uh, he like a like, foil in it? I, not, I mean, not even, that didn't get that much play, it doesn't seem That's like. That's giving him too much credit still. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think most of the kingly language is seems to be a little more metaphorical than re- like referring to the king as a whole. Um, and so it kind of leaves, for me, it leaves an open question. So then what is the association with Solomon? Is it just simply simply something that was dedicated to him, even while he was still alive? Like, was this a play that was performed in his presence? And here you go, Solomon, and we wrote this wonderful love story. We're dedicating it to you. Action. Is yeah. it that kind yeah. of a thing? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, uh, a, uh, a suggestion that's been put out there. Okay. But if I were Solomon, I might be offended if <laughs> right. I exactly. wrote that's this <laughs> book that refers to me twice as the guy you reject. <laughs> or the outsider right. who, at the end of the day, you end up rejecting for someone else. So I, I don't know. It's uh, it would be kind of an insulting dedication. Yeah, I mean, it does. <laughs> it also leads to, I mean, what is it, what would it look like to be, you know, sort of against Solomon, like where the the philandering, like womanizing Solomon never got love, but this does, right? So it's not quite a foil, but it's using him as as people know him to be that guy. Um, it's almost like uh, like uh, Hugh Hefner, right? <laughs> like you have these women, but do you even know what love is? And so, yes, someone could have had the opportunity to be with you and be at the Playboy Mansion, but they turn that down for this other, you know, for this other thing that's actually true love. That's a possibility. I mean, because yeah, I can see a king like Solomon maybe being offended <laughs> by yeah, his, right. by his role in it, but I could almost see a king like Solomon being touched by it. I don't think it has to be read as something that would get your head cut off if it was performed in Solomon's presence. And I'm not saying it was or wasn't. I'm just you know putting right. it out there. That it could be a love story that for Solomon would bring a tear to his eye to say, here is a different version of romantic love that as king I will I may never experience. Yeah. Well, let me introduce some other factors that also play into interpretation uh, about date. Like there, there are certain things we can use um, that help us try to locate when this was written. There's no verse in it that says, and this was written during right. the reign of so-and-so, right? right? Yeah. I mean, if it said written by Solomon, and then it, there's internal evidence that he wrote it, well, then you have your date, right? <laughs> the time period of Solomon. Uh, we don't have that concrete of evidence, but what we do have is there's certainly themes and images that go to the monarchical period. Sure. Yeah. You know, palanquins and like farmers, and you have kings and queen mothers. Like this time period seems to be situated in Israel's monarchy. It's it's definitely situated in a time where Solomon's going around with bridal parties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we we have a we have a situation for the story world of the book, which is monarchical, uh, which is not the same thing as this was written during a monarchical period. Yeah. So you can write. You know, you can write a story today about the time period of Israel's monarchy, right. or of the time of Jesus, or of the, you know, 1500s. Um, the Hebrew, and, and this is tricky because I don't have this kind of mastery of Hebrew. You might be closer, Sam, but there are people who can like date the Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Like there's early Hebrew, middle Hebrew, late Hebrew, modern Hebrew, right? Right. Um, so the Hebrew writing feels more like the Hebrew writing of the third to fourth century, right? BC. Post-exilic, yeah. So the yeah, pretty deep into the post-exilic period, um, which suggests that this is a like it's not monarchical Hebrew. Have you heard differently or no? I mean, you know I, I've heard the same, and that yeah. there are examples of you know as, as languages transform over time, and they just like we, we do things with language now that we didn't do a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, etc. And so, for uh, you know, using certain words or using certain forms um, that like didn't exist back then, lead, lead you to believe, okay, this is a later production. There are some examples of that in Song of Songs. I will agree. <laughs> you have more or less to say about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, this is getting like such a far afield. It's getting like source criticism and everything else. Where the idea of there's when something was written, and then 
perhaps when something was edited or updated or changed, mm -hmm. right? So something could have been in existence during the monarchical period and then later in time was tweaked. And so certain new elements were added that, that introduce those late language um, uh, sort of evolutions that don't necessarily mean it was all written in the third or fourth century. Is the Hebrew of it like a, a, a more pedestrian kind of a Hebrew or a higher, more literate kind of a Hebrew? Uh, it's poetry, so with all Hebrew poetry, it's annoying. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's 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 not uh, it's not like there's a Koine Greek and a like a yeah. Koine Hebrew and a right, you yeah. know classical Hebrew. It's just it's pretty standardized. Okay, so I, it'd be hard to make that distinction. Okay, yeah, and in Hebrew, I mean, poetry goes way back. Yeah, poetry is old. Yeah, and yeah, so it's hard. Yeah, and I my Hebrew is not a level. This is one of those claims where I can read in the commentaries, and I just have to trust them. Yes, yeah. like sure. I, I'm trusting that you're saying it. This feels like third to fourth century Hebrew. I don't know enough about Hebrew to challenge that. Mm -hmm. And and there's just what you read through it, you don't get date markers like yeah. the categories of a loved, beloved, a lover. There are places that have fences and posts and houses, <laughs> and people have like all of all of the poetry is. You know, you could write this stuff in multiple periods throughout world history, mm -hmm. and and the categories and language. I mean, you might we talked about this a little bit before, but the nature of poetry and love songs is they're kind of timeless. Yeah, yeah. Um, so not a lot of strong chronological markers. Right. Um, you know, other things. I'm not sure how date related this is, but it, it says a little bit about its reception. Uh, it was used as festival reading for Passover. Yep. <laughs> Since 700 um, A.D., which is really interesting that this is the book. If you want to have a book associated with Passover, Song of Songs is the one you pick. It's yeah. fascinating. We'll talk maybe more about that next episode. Okay. I look forward to that. Um, its canonical status was still debated by the mainstream church in the 2nd century A.D. Yep. And so this is one of the late, later accepted books, um, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Right, that it would be accepted at this later date. So, I mean, we're, we're about the end of our time. Um, yeah, there's definitely a connection to Solomon. It definitely seems to be situated during the period of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And he's definitely a, a figure in the cast. Right. A minor figure compared to the woman, the man, and her Entourage. Co cohort of ladies. Maybe next week we'll know what yes. the proper term is for that. <laughs> <laughs> the modern proper term for that. Uh, but he's a relatively minor figure in it, so it doesn't have the feel of being written by him. I, you know, to write a book where you're kind of the rejected one doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, and to add more to it, I mean, th this is the genre of it is this love poem that's similar to um, there are Egyptian love poems like this that are from Bronze Age, Iron Age time. So, like the sort of stuff literature you would find in the third, fourth century, there's not anything really like this, but there's a lot like this back going back further around the monarchical period. So it leads you to believe like, so how does that play into it as well? So yeah. there's like a tug of war between the monarchical period and the post exilic period. Yeah. Some evidence pulling you one direction, mm -hmm. others another direction. Solomon's in there, but he's in there in a way that's not clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know how to give meaning to that prepositional Lamed. <laughs> I, at most, I can say it's at some level about Solomon. Yes. I have thoughts, but I think I'm going to save them for our next episode. Can't wait. Yeah. Like, I have anything really good to say about I it. I believe but it's I, good. I have some thoughts on it. All right. Well, until then, thanks for joining us for this inaugural <laughs> <laughs> edition of our Song of Solomon study. Um, How yeah. do we end it? After class because... Oh, yeah. The best conversations <laughs> happen. <laughs> <laughs> After class? Ron? Anything? <laughs> oh, yikes. Thank you for listening to this episode of the After Class Podcast. After Class is hosted by Sam Long, Ron Peters, and John Nugent. Social media networking is managed by Darren Harris. Audio mixing and additional production is done by Drew Nyquist.